Black Cats Run podcast. I'm Tristan Black Ingersoll. This is Black Cats Run. Today's episode, we explore how much control do we actually have over athletic experience? Are the kinds of traumas, adversities, and hardships we face an inevitable part of pursuing our athletic goals? Or are they an indication of a fundamentally flawed approach and mindset in the pursuit of athletics overall? If you've enjoyed the podcast so far, please feel free to share with other people you know who might be interested interested in the kinds of conversations and questions we explore here on the podcast you can find us on instagram at black cats run send us a message let us know what you think about the pod and if you have any questions or topics that you'd like to see us explore we're also available for consultation if you are wondering about how you can apply any of the concepts or ideas that we talk about in the pod in your own training let's get into today's episode The problem is, doing things that are hard makes us feel good. So why are so many athletes miserable? Here's what I see as the common interpretation. Everything around the sport, or sports, if you're a multi-sport athlete, is the problem. Our health issues are what need to be addressed or responded to. But it's never the core practice of training. Training is just a mountain, and maybe we trash ourselves as a result of trying to reach its summit, but ultimately it exists in its own space. It's a monolith that we choose to engage with or avoid or something in between at our discretion. Although the training methods might change, the reality is that the mountain itself does not change. It's fixed, it's interminable, eternal. There's nothing about it that suggests that it is at all flexible or understanding. You know, it is an amoral space. We climb as high up on that as we can. People seem to think that then the training methods might determine how high up the mountain you reach, how fast you ascend, etc. Training is about how effectively you're able to climb the slopes of that mountain. And as you advance up the mountain, it rapidly becomes more challenging, steeper, the rate of failure and people falling off, sliding down, getting injured encountering those personal limitations, all that starts to increase. And I feel that in culture, one of the things that has happened more and more is that there's this sense of, well, top athletes are finally feeling comfortable talking about the kinds of adversities and hardships and challenges that they have long been pressured to not acknowledge because they need to maintain this kind of a facade and that really we're going to unveil this massive and deep-rooted mental health crisis that has been just getting swept under the carpet of high performance, and that it is going to alter or change our understanding of the mountain itself. What should our expectations be around it? Is it even safe to go near it? You know, who or whom are the select few who can actually engage with it and that, you know, we should really recognize that the value of the mountain is what we create from it and that the value we need to be creating is that it draws attention to all of the challenges and other limiting factors that become manifest as we engage with its absolute and unchanging adversity. Here's what I would like to suggest instead. We're studying physical responses to stimuli and the application of science through the scientific method has begun to try to empirically identify the presumably beneficial adaptive responses to being subjected to stress through identifiable markers, things like blood lactate, 
um, VLA max, VO2, uh, mitochondrial biogenesis, hematocrit, body fat percentage, etc. Trying to find different things to quantify and more and more things to quantify to try to create um, a more accurate picture of what might be going on um, through engaging with training. We're not studying the aggregate effect of doing this stuff on the person, on the individual, though. That doesn't seem to be happening. I think what actually happens is there's a break point of stress past homeostasis, out of homeostasis, at which we exceed our ability to both adapt and remain healthy. And what's happening is we're looking at the mountain and this concept of the mountain as this immutable object that we just have to subdue, right, or apply our will to, act upon as individuals or as uh, teams of people working on an athletic problem, and that these quantifiable things are what are helping us define what this mountain is, because the mountain itself isn't like, it's like an invisible object, right? We can't literally see it. If we could literally see it, it would be much easier to know what is the best route to try to reach the summit. But we can't see it. So you could either think of it as being invisible, or you might think of it as we put a blindfold on, and then we're trying to use these other pieces of sensory information, in a sense, these empiricized pieces of data to try to create the portrait of what does it look like to climb this mountain. But this concept isn't really, I think, that functional. I think that it's limiting. And I think that we are creating the problems that we are experiencing. I don't think that the problems that we experience are the natural consequence of the mountain. I think it's a consequence of the fact that we think the mountain exists. And in today's episode, I want to suggest that it doesn't exist at all. And that when we experience the kinds of like externality hardships that athletes are starting to try to feel more comfortable talking about and defining, that I think the conclusion isn't that this is a problem with how we approach the mountain. I think the conclusion is it's a problem that we've invented a mountain where one doesn't really exist. It's invisible because it's not really there. Let's talk a little bit more about what this mountain means. So imagine a literal mountain, right? You could think of something severe and imposing like K2 or Mount Everest. And at the top of that mountain, if you can reach the top, that's where you find world records or the most championship medals of all time, or something else highly desirable and so unachievable as to be virtually unattainable. We concoct this in and through our visualization of what training is, that training is this process of ascension from being in a basic state to an advanced state. LeBron James um, set the record for most career points scored in the NBA the other day. And uh, there was a clip of him joking with his two sons and saying, oh, which one of you is going to break my record? And they were just kind of like looking awkward. And I'm sure partly it's because all of the people are there with the cameras and the media and whatever. And I'm sure that's weird if you haven't been in that space for 20 years like um, LeBron James has. But it's sort of interesting to look at the comments because people are just like, oh, they can do it. If they just work hard enough, you know, they can commit. Like if anybody can do it, it could be them, you know, 40,000 points, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, I'm like, this is just ridiculous. Like, you know, I think it's awkward for the kids because, you know, they know that they're never going to do that. You know, that's impossible for them. But the cultural response, you know, to the extent that we can take comments on any piece of social media as a representative window into cultural response. But if we do, the cultural response is that, well, yeah, you know, you just have to climb that 
mountain, right? You have to put in the work, et cetera, et cetera, right? And the idea is that if as long as you can get to that next step, right, you'll just inevitably inevitably move one step closer to those ultimate accolades and achievement that await people at the top. So the question isn't whether or not it's realistic for you as an individual to get there. The question um, is whether or not you have the toughness and the capacity and the you know willingness to overcome the adversity. And as long as you can do those things, you will get there. So it, in that sense, it becomes like our weakness is exposed by the mountain. And then the question is, can we overcome that or will we be controlled by that? And if you're somebody for whom you get to be at the top of this mountain, which you have, the mountain is invisible, you have a blindfold on, so you only know you're at the top because people say, hey, you're at the top, right? So, oh, I'm at the top. I'm at the top of the mountain. This is awesome, right? But you don't actually know. You only know this from these external things or, you know, you have this incredible, you know, list of physiological markers. You're at the top of the mountain, right? But we can't actually see that right? It's invisible to us. And other people can't see it either, right? And yet somehow we know who's at the top and who isn't. I have uh, three younger siblings, and on the pod, I've often referred to my youngest brother, Camden, but my other brother, who's um, in between Camden and I in age, two years younger than me, um, Miles, also six foot four, uh, but very different in his approach to exercise from Camden. He can get very invested in whatever it is he's working on at any given time. Whatever that interest is, he really dives pretty deeply into that. And with athletics, he's always been very much about pushing into the pain zone. And he certainly had his share of injuries as a consequence of this, I would say a direct consequence of this. Um, For example, in college... He liked to do the same loop every single day over the summer, about 6.7 miles, and try to do it faster every day, you know, clenching his fists, you know, with intensity, you know, and focus the whole time. And he can sometimes show uh, what looks like, you know, a very fixed mindset about these kinds of things. And I think that you know, you have to sort of work within the space of what mindsets people find to be meaningful and rewarding and productive to an extent. And I think that can be valuable. So last winter, we came up with a session um, that was definitely high intensity. And the session was doing four sets of six times 40 seconds at 500 watts uh, with two and a half minute easy spinning in between, and then a 15-minute spin uh, between sets. Okay, so really trying to make sure to implement the rest needed to be able to perform those 40-second intervals um, of 500 watts to perform them, you know, correctly, right? To try to stay within the proficiency of that's possible at that level of work for him. And this is kind of his style uh, preferentially. And, you know, he was you know, totally into it. And and the whole session, you know, it might seem small, but if you do the whole session, it takes two and a half hours. And if you add the 15 minute cool down, it's two hours and 45 minutes. So it's a significant time commitment. And through the period where he did this workout a number of times, he seemed to show some big improvement. Um, And I would say this period was longer than a month, but less than two months. And really, he couldn't do the workout I would say more than maybe once every 10 days. I think once a week sort of looked like that was too much. Um, And now he hasn't done endurance exercise, cardiovascular exercise since mid-June of last year. In hindsight, I think we created something that was effective, but ended up being ineffective. So we created something that was a high intensity interval session that really maximized um, the intensity that he could engage in. And he exhibited positive response and lower level endurance, more endurance ended intensities. And 
after, you know, six to eight weeks of it, I don't think he ever did the workout again. And then, you know, in June, he got injured and he still has not managed to come back from that injury. And I don't think the workout was the problem per se. Okay, and this is the complexity of thinking about high intensity. I think reinforcing the mindset of I have to find the pain and then push into it as far as I can. That's the mountain there. Okay, because he exhibited some benefit from it. But after a certain period of time, it was just not something that he could sustain as a repeatable training intervention. So maybe doing it, you know, the one time or maybe twice is it. And then maybe you need to wait 10 weeks before you come back to something like that again, which I mean, seems so um, dispersed as that people might think, well, what's the point? That's not even going to be productive. But he didn't climb the mountain. You know, he made an initial rush up the slope and then it just sort of stagnated. And now he's, you know, all the way off the bottom again in the lowlands. And I think that's where we are missing kind of the concept is we're looking at and we're saying, well, if you apply this, how fast will we ascend? And then people are saying, okay, that's great. We want a a rapid rate of ascension. We want to be doing something that's going to move us towards the top. And so we could look at that workout and we could say, wow, what an effective workout really made progress. But if you look at what actually happens in aggregate, there was no progress. And I would argue uh, in this case that by pushing into that resistance, you're codifying in your mind the need to be in that basically traumatic space, right? You're opening that up and you're normalizing that. And I'm not an expert on this stuff. So, you know, we're here in this episode to think about this problem differently, not to try to like assert some sort of like absolute truths. But it does seem like, you know, for people, even if a space is traumatic and negative and undesirable, they will sort of seem primed or inclined to get pulled, if you will, back into that space again and again and again. You know, why is that? I don't know. I don't have like the core explanation of that per se, but, you know, in a sort of reflective perspective, I might say that, you know, perhaps we are creating these sorts of patterns or grooves where we fall into, where we go back to what's normal and familiar, not necessarily what's you know, optimal and best. And so because we have this collective belief in the mountain, and and even though none of us can see it, you know, but we're, we're recognizing people who we think have gotten to the top. And then but then other people come along, and they seem to exceed that. And then well, now they're at the top. And so this mountain, which we're saying is this absolute, um, you know, thing, Um, when the way we seem to think about it doesn't really seem to be that absolute, which is kind of an interesting problem. And I think a common interpretation of fitness, um, performance in athletics, and to be fair, other places, is to think of the athlete very much as that, I guess, would be in the role of the mountain climber, the mountaineer, and that somewhere beyond those clouds, the ultimate fitness exists, and that you need to apply that, right? And you could say, well, you know, if only he had kept doing the four by six by 40 seconds at 500 watts, you know, he would be, you know, well up the mountain by now. Right. And I think that's where how are we interpreting what this problem or this puzzle of fitness development and what we're trying to both achieve and what we're trying to take away from it really matters quite a bit. Because as we try to climb the mountain, we encounter problems and challenges And then we define that as our weaknesses and flaws being exposed. And we confirm this because we say that other people climb the mountain and they do that without apparently these weaknesses and flaws being exposed. So that shows us that it's not the mountain, it's us, right? The mountain is, you know, not moral or immoral, it's amoral, right? It's not an entity, it doesn't have intention, it just sort of exists and we go to that space Um, And we encounter that. And if we experience negative ramifications, that tells us more about ourselves than it does about the space that we are entering into. 
and we could reach the conclusion that that some of us don't have what it takes and we lack the ability to just do it and symptomatic of the weakness um, is the accelerating nature of the personal um, problems. And I don't mean personal. Sometimes we say personal as in a sort of like dismissive, dis- diminishing sense. I say personal as in specific to the individual, uh, personal problems that manifest themselves, you know, as we're trying to climb the mountain. And this is just a list of some things that sort of come to my mind generically. Uh, but I think that we could be more specific with all of these and I think there are other things in addition to this list, but accumulating self-doubt, the um, evidence of being mentally weak, um, mental health problems of different sorts, uh, disordered relationships with food, injuries, um, discovering that you're injury prone, uh, burnout, lack of interest, um, negative relationships with other people. Um, loss of joy in the activity that you know brought you to the mountain in the first place, um, a increasingly dissociative feeling and response to the activity, you know, and again, like I said, you know, the list goes on and the list can be more specific within these categories. And looming over this list is this um, truth that the mountain is an inert, neutral, passive thing. It's a sorter of people. And that we come to that space and we learn that we don't have what it takes. And because we have all of these other things or some combination of these things or a particular struggle with one of those things. And as a consequence, we have a limitation of how close we can get to the summit. But the mountain isn't really real if you look at it from a different perspective. It's an allegory of the cave issue. We take this thing to be real because we aren't given anything to compare it to. Just as we, say, interpret the ideal training intensity as needed because we have no equivalent value alternative to compare it to. Now, being in the cave, we don't understand that we're in the cave. That's the whole concept of Plato's allegory is that The people in the cave have never been out of the cave, so they see these shadows being cast on the wall, and they think those shadows are real, and they don't know that they're only shadows, and it's only if you bring these people out of the cave that they can see this stuff differently, right? And you could say, well, the allegory of the cave probably has a lot to do with the concept of paradigm shift as we think about that now, and I think that would be very true. Um, But I think when you don't understand that the mountain is just this thing that we've imagined. It's this shadow cast on the wall um, but that we just think is real because we don't have any other perspective on this. Um, the conclusion can become that the mountain is sort of this dangerous, treacherous place, um, a kind of a, you know, quote, enter at your own risk, unquote, kind of thing, and that the climb is unhealthy, right? And some people will attack it in that sense. And sort of say, well, you know, the pursuit of the summit is wrong and flawed and it's bad and we shouldn't go near the mountain. And that, you know, people who go near the mountain is just, you know, a place of doom. So either the mountain is just fundamentally toxic, you know, or, you know, we as individuals are flawed, right? Some people are savages, you know, some people are absolute dogs, you know, some people are not. However, when you realize you've made the problem, because you have made a mountain, you can step out of that cave and realize that you've been living in a trauma of your own genesis. Because there is no mountain. It's a social manifestation of a willful engagement in an absurdist liminality mindset of what it means to become more than what we currently are. One of the challenges that comes with shifting understanding is we might engage with something and find it to be sort of sending off these signals of self-doubt or self-questioning. And I think the reason why we get to that point is because we might feel that something isn't working for us. We might sense that other people seem to be 
getting faster in the mile in high school and then you're not and you know you are working hard and you know that you're making the effort and you're being maybe told that you're not working hard enough or you're not being tough enough and so these kinds of interpretations are being brought to you because right of other people's perspective of the mountain and what it means to engage with its slopes and you know why are some people further up those slopes than you are and if we don't have an alternative understanding, right, what are we going to do, right? We're going to sort of be left with the inevitable conclusion that, you know, we are the problem, even if at first, you know, or in other ways, we might sort of be wondering to some degree, is this system, is this thing really doing what it's supposed to do for me? You know, is is this really the right way to be climbing the mountain for me? And it's like, no, like the mountain is the mountain, you know, and, and you this is the best possible way for you to be climbing the mountain. And so if you can't climb the mountain with this, like you're just not meant to climb the mountain. And I think that then pushes all of those negatives into us. And, you know, I'm not trying to offer a diagnosis of the causality of mental health, but I, to speak in a simply a metaphorical kind of a sense, right, when we look at these issues that we have with our relationship with the self, with the relationship, um, you know, with food, um, our perspective on our mesomorphic uh, makeup, are we built the right way physically for what we're trying to do? I think, you know, how much of that, right, could be changed or not experienced if we didn't insist upon this concept of the mountain, right, where we start to feel like, well, I am a flawed, broken person because other people can climb this mountain, but I can't. So let's think about um, the concept of homeostasis versus trauma and how big is the gap between these? Because I think what we see um, is something that looks a lot like people uh, having, I mean, I'm kind of making this phrase up, obviously, but you know, post-traumatic training disorder, where having tried to engage in training, right, you know, the act of climbing the mountain um, in that constructed sense, that we then see people come away from that um, basically like damaged. Um, and that doesn't, you know, deride or limit their actual value as an indiv individual, but that they come away with sorts of these um, burdens of, you know, personal weight um, related to their well-being that presumably they wouldn't have had if they hadn't gone to the mountain in the first place. And I think there's um, a difference between questioning whether or not we know something versus whether or not we're even capable of understanding that. And I think as long as we're trapped in the cave, you know, those sorts of things are going to continue to happen. And so is that space of traumatic reaction, right, as a result of trying to train, trying to climb the mountain, is that actually a consequence not of this mountain thing, this absolute inevitable, unavoidable thing, but is that instead a consequence of the fact that we have basically invented that traumatic space for ourselves. And I don't think that this is something that could be extended to all forms of trauma or hardship in general. I'm talking specifically about and wondering specifically about um, this area. And I want to emphasize again that I'm wondering about this. I'm not trying to assert this, right? We're, I'm speculating, right? And we're thinking, we're puzzling through, is there a different possibility here? And I think then there becomes a misinterpretation that you could take from this and say, like, oh, yeah, well, that's just personal responsibility. You know, people, they're exactly right. They're not being tough. You know, they're not responding to adversity in the right way. If they would just choose to respond to that differently, then they wouldn't be like that. You know, they're, they are weak, right? That's what that proves. I don't think that way, nor am I trying to suggest that that's the case at all. I think that actually what we're seeing is that our belief of what we need to do, the space that we need to choose to create as athletes, if we want to be athletes, and then if we want to continue to improve as athletes, is that we think we need to arrive at the slopes of this mountain. But if we took our blindfold off, 
right, we would recognize that there's just nothing there, that we're just in a room and we've never left that room. But we have created the feeling of being on the mountain because of the choices we've made in terms of how we pursue this stuff. And we want adaptation. That's the point that we're looking for. But trauma does not lead to growth. And I think that high intensity training is basically a form of trauma because when you get much past the point of homeostasis, I think that's basically what we start to experience is we start to experience a kind of trauma situation. I mean, the body has a homeostasis um, you know, functionality because that's a good productive state to be in. When we look at how people practice effectively for things, we see that they're staying within their threshold of proficiency. They're not going to a level of failure with their skill and then practicing it at a failed state. They're working you know, up to, but always within the peak of how they can currently apply that skill. But that sort of blindfold mentality of, well, these are the you know, physiological parameters that we can elicit from this stuff, um, I think is a very like constrained and narrow-minded approach and pathway because we're sort of dismissing by virtue of the way in which these studies are designed and then the way in which we um, look to these studies to sort of validate um, you know, ideas about you know, the value of really pushing the envelope um, as, as being useful and, and being critical. And so you have these um, paradigms that have developed, I would say these ineffective paradigms, um, paradigms that have developed where people are being subjected to high intensity training, but that that high intensity training is basically high intensity trauma. And that you can, if you're targeting those physiological goals or those benchmarks, you know, or some sort of metabolite markers or, you know, signals or things that, you know, we associate with mitochondrial biogenesis and, you know, whatever those targets are, you can elicit responses and you can elicit changes in those things um, through trauma. Like trauma leads to response and change because if people survive a traumatic experience, right, they must have had something that allowed them to adapt to that, that it disrupted their homeostasis and then they move past that. And you can see, right, that the body, and I've said this before in the podcast, but I think it makes sense from a perspective of evolutionary logic that the body and the mind, right, being one thing that, you know, people would be capable of doing that. But, you know, just because you can create or measure, hey, you know, we have these adaptive responses. Well, if we're looking at that, at that over the short term, you know, trauma isn't something that happens instantaneously, uh, trauma is something that can be accumulated, you know, over over you know what we might think of as maybe more moderate levels of exposure over an extended period of time. You know, you can think about that in terms of the breadth of exposure as well as the depth of exposure. And what does trauma really seem to actually lead to overall? Well, it leads to stagnation, malfunction, maladaptation, maladjustment. Trauma is not desirable, but it's easily uh, solicited. We get to that state very quickly and very easily because we think that that's adversity. We're sort of confusing trauma with adversity. And I think, you know, for being um, accurate, I think we could say that, you know, trauma is a form of adversity. But if we're going to say that failure is where we learn and if we're going to say adversity is beneficial, then I think we can't really continue to say that trauma and adversity are somehow equivalent. Because, you know, adversity then, or failure would be sort of working at the boundary, the outer bounds of what's homeostatically possible. And that uh, trauma would be going beyond that point. So we need to make a distinction between those things. And, you know, this is trauma thing being desirable is constructed by the mountain, because then it's like, you know, as in, essentially you can say within this kind of thought experiment that, um, well, as you climb the mountain, what we're discovering is at what point will you sort of become traumatized? And that essentially there's a very, very small group of people who can go all the way up to that summit, right? Although, again, this is all in our head, 
this mountain and the idea of a summit is all in our head. But, um, you know, these people who can go in this imaginary world, go all the way up to the top uh, without getting traumatized, that those people are somehow totally unique and exceptional. But the reality is that the mountain, when we accept it doesn't exist and we accept that we are stuck in the cave, if we step outside of the cave and we start thinking about what's actually real, you know, we set the slope of that, right? The choices that we made, we make about this and they are choices. And I think, again, because you're in the cave, if you feel that these aren't choices and this is what you have to do and what has to be done, well, that's because you're in the cave. And the whole point is when you're in the cave, you can't explain to the people in the cave that they're in the cave. That's why it's so difficult to communicate this. That's why horses are dying of thirst all across America every day. Um, but we don't have to climb. You know, we could crawl, we could walk, or we could just abandon this thing altogether because the training is a choice. You know, how much greater should the adversity be beyond what's homeostatically easy? I think it's a very small space. Um, there needs to be enough homeostatic disruption or static um as in uh, like, you know, static buzz, right? Humming on that border. Um, there needs to be enough homeostatic static then um, to get the body to move out of that highly energy efficient state to the point where it feels, in this, if we're going to anthropomorphize, you know, these epigenetics, where at the point where it feels that there's value to expressing these additional adaptations, that it's more energy efficient to make these changes than it is to send out these pain signals. But traumatizing the body doesn't enhance this, right? Trauma doesn't lead to growth, you know, and we can very quickly go beyond that into that trauma response. And, you know, what are the signals that we're in a bad place, right? You know, pain, agony, anguish, severe stress, um, if there's a place that we dread to be, like we dread training and we dread working out, to me, I would associate that with um, something that's traumatic. It's not a positive thing. If you think about how many people can cramp up in races, we find this to be really myster mysterious. How do we solve that? But maybe it just shows like how hard people are capable of working beyond their current level of fitness development. And maybe if you went back and you looked at it differently, and you trained them differently, right? And you didn't push that adversity on them, maybe they would be better prepared and they wouldn't be, you know, having total catastrophic muscular failure. Again, just a possibility, not necessarily an absolute fact. Um, one thing that we have seen is that our understanding of trauma and mental health in general has evolved rapidly um, in, you know, the past years. You think about for one simple example um, would be our perspective on concussions. When I was in high school, I nobody cared. Um, but, you know, now it's a big deal, right? You know, people pay attention to it and they're engaged with that, right? And our understanding too within this space is that, you know, the physical and the mechanical and, you know, mental health are also physiological, Right. Physiology is, is, this, is a study of function, how things function, and our mental health has a system of function. Right. It's not these um, ethereal, um, you know, thoughts just, you know, floating in, you know, this imaginary plane of existence, totally distinct and separate from our body. Everything that we think, feel and experience is a consequence of this. So how can we conceptualize what training should actually look like, what progress from A to B looks like if we're not going to look at it through this um, liminal mountain of uh, ascension and transformation as a space that separates those who can from those who can't. Well, there's a concept in economics called the production possibilities frontier, um, or you might say production possibilities curve, although the production possibilities curve is really a dynamic um, of the production possibilities frontier. And you can check out our Instagram page. Uh, we'll have some stuff up to show this visually. But essentially what the production possibility frontier does, it sort of asks, asks the question, 
between uh, you know two different things that could be produced. You know, if you put all of your resources into one, how much of that could you make? And if you put all of them into another, how much of that could you make? So we could put, if we wanted, um, let's say, lactate threshold intensity hours um, on the y-axis, and we could put high intensity hours on the x-axis. And let's say that there's a four to one ratio. Let's say that you can do four for every... um, hour of high intensity training that you can produce, you can produce uh, four hours of lactate threshold intensity training. And I think that's pretty generous, frankly, towards high intensity training. For my brother's uh, example workout of the um, 24 times 40 seconds, right? That's not even a 24 minute workout, right? That's probably closer to 20 minutes. And, you know, he's doing that maybe once every 10 days. Um, but in that time, right, you could accumulate, you know, maybe four or six hours pretty easily of work at lactate threshold, right? So you might even say the ratio is could be as high as eight to one or 10 to one, right? Depends on um, the individual. And then I think it depends on how high you determine that high intensity to be. But let's just so when we say we're going to use a four to one ratio, I want to make the point that I think that's actually very much uh, weighting things a little bit in favor of high intensity. So, you know, if you look at studies, a study might try to show, um, compa- no, there's a, I mean, not, let's use a real example. So there's a study done that um, took athletes and had them train um, both of their legs. Um, in isolation in different ways and look for difference in mitochondrial biogenesis uh, or markers of mitochondrial biogenesis. And um, one leg did 30 minutes of continuous moderate intensity and the other leg did, um, I think it was four times five minutes um, of high intensity with a short recovery in between each. And I said, oh, the high intensity leg um, did this differently. And, And then as a consequence, the high intensity leg showed more uh, markers of mitochondrial biogenesis. Well, first of all, um, you know, if you really want to figure that out, you got to apply it to athletes over 12 months and you got to see, can they keep it up? And then I would say, well, what's the consequence of this? Because that's traumatic. Uh, it's, it's traumatic to subject people to that kind of stress over an extended period of time. And people reach that point pretty quickly. And I think that's something that intuitively maybe makes sense to us, but we're told to question, you know, what we think and feel so much that it's hard to make space for that understanding. But you want to go a step further. And if you think about the production possibilities frontier, the production possibilities frontier for training isn't um, proportional time. Um, The production possibilities is not, um, you know, for every one hour of high intensity, the alternative is one hour of lactate threshold intensity. So, and then if you think about Um, the benefits that you get, okay, maybe there are, let's just accept that finding as truth. Maybe there are in that um, instance, slightly higher findings for mitochondrial biogenesis. Okay. But you're not going to train in that way. The production possibilities frontier tells us that for every, um, you know, decrease in one unit of high intensity training, we're going to see a Um, significant increase in the amount of lactate threshold intensity training that would be possible and that you're going to need to look at that to understand the comparison of those benefits. But when we think about it in this kind of a sense, it obscures and limits our ability to understand what's actually going on um, with training and, you know, it feeds into our perception of what's the best strategy to climb the mountain, right? And if we think in the sense of the mountain, right? And if we think in that sense, we're going to say, well, this is showing that this is going to climb the mountain faster. And then we're going to say, okay, well, this is where I need to be. This is what I need to be doing. But if we get rid of that idea and we substitute that for something else, okay, it becomes much easier to recognize that those kinds of strategies maybe don't really make sense. And that what we're really looking at then is, you know, a a fundamental issue, I think, in study design and and the way that people try to make sense of this stuff. And there needs to be maybe more of an economics 
uh, type approach to this and looking at like actual data. What's what does the actual performance look like? We could also say that uh, the mountain is creating um, kind of what the flow state ratio in terms of psychology feels like, and that when we're selecting training that drives up the level of challenge so much um, that we're necessarily depreciating our skill because our skill is a proportional capacity um, to perform or do things relative to whatever the challenge is. So when we drive up that high intensity, right, to the point of high intensity trauma, right, where we're trying to elicit a stronger response by pushing the body outside of that homeostatic static of sort of buzzing on that boundary, and we're trying to push beyond the production possibilities curve, in a sense, um, well, we're just eliciting a situation where we trend now out of that sort of flow state into when we have a high level of challenge and a low level of skill, um, anxiety, right? Right away, we see in that model that that's a situation where you know, mental health, right? That's a negative state um, to be in. Um, And anxiety can be really, really bad um, and really, really inhibiting, you know, basically borderline uh, emotionally crippling where you just like can't do anything when that's really reared its head. And, you know, we need to look at that kind of thing and ask, is this really what we want to be doing? Um, And then we need to further ask, is this what it means to be an athlete? Because this is one of the, um, you know, her- Herculean tasks that lies uh, for those, it lies in wait for those who wish to summit the mountain. Or can we take this different perspective and say, this actually isn't how it needs to be. And I think that um, when we think about something like that, we can then say that adding trauma and stress is lowering us down on the hierarchy of needs, where now we're dropping out of the range of self-esteem and self-actualization, where we're in a state of crisis. And if you go back to those sorts of negative things that can seem to be um, manifesting or developing out of engagement with this climb the mountain paradigm, um, you know, those are things that push us down into that space. And so it's going to become increasingly difficult to be successful. So it's not, the mountain is making it difficult to be successful, but the question is also who's making the mountain? Well, our choices are making the mountain. And, you know, then you get into the question of to what extent our coaches um, or, uh, you know, organizing committee committees that decide who gets what opportunities, to what extent do those people function as gatekeepers that sort of push people into these different directions Um, And that's a really critical question in and of itself uh, right there, um, which we'll have to explore down the road and not um, necessarily in the bounds of this particular episode. When we do this, um, right, we're failing to recognize where the homeostatic uh, wobble actually happens, which is, I think, at the production possibilities frontier which is, again, that same concept of, like, you know, work within that limitation. You can do a very tiny amount of high-intensity training um, because you need to stay under that high-intensity, you know, the boundary point at which high-intensity training becomes high-intensity trauma, right? It's it's very small, and you can't do very much of that before you get to that point. Um, and even if you are, over time, it might sort of develop into that anyway. And I think when you think about traditional overtraining, you know, we would just say, well, that's just beyond the production possibilities frontier. We would just simplify it and say it's overtraining. But we're saying something more than that, right? And I can see where somebody could reach the conclusion and say, well, this is just like a totally inane, you know, indirect ramble of trying to explain overreaching or overtraining. And I think um, we're saying that overtraining isn't like just this thing that can be determined empirically or physiologically of like, oh, the athlete isn't progressing, they're regressing by these physiological benchmarks. We're saying that overtraining is this far more complicated uh, trauma response where you start to see all of these negatives come up and that our concept of what um, overtraining with is such an oversimplification or such a narrow spectrum of what goes on that I think we basically need to dump that term. 
um, and that the possibility um, for trauma, when you look at that production possibilities curve, um, like the space outside of that curve is like infinite in a sense compared to what's within that zone. And what's incredible about training is the ability to expand that production possibilities curve. But to expand that curve, you can't do that. You can't produce beyond your resources. You know, that's a basic economic fact. You can't produce beyond your resources. And if you want to have that, you know, change, I mean, in aggregate supply, aggregate demand sense, you can't just like increase the demand. You're just going to cause inflation. You're going to cause trauma to an economy, right? If you just increase demand for work, you're going to cause trauma to yourself as an athlete. And it's empowering sometimes to recognize we are responsible for our own problems because it means that we have the capacity to more directly um, intervene in in those areas. And just because we might have responsibility for these kind of high intensity trauma that we experience as athletes, this is not meant to be some sort of, you know, applicable to other forms of trauma and say, well, that means in general in trauma, we're always responsible. You know, there's basically just a really short range before trauma with HIT versus with lactate threshold. There's just way more, you know, gray area. But when I think as coaches or athletes, we interpret and we say that, well, everything, you know, in the green zone of, say, Steven Seiler's, you know, model of what kind of how training sort of seems to be polarized out. Well, that's all active recovery. <laughs> We're basically saying that, you know, okay, well, we need to be experiencing some, some level of trauma. And I mean, it's not, I mean, it's sort of so absurd that you want to laugh, but it's also like very unfunny uh, when you recognize that, like um, the effects of this are really bad, right? It, they're not good. They're not. They're not quote unquote low key. Um, we want to stay out of those spaces. And I think another thing that we can think about when we try to make sense of this is um, how do we rhetorically reinforce this? So one thing that I have heard, um, uh, rule of thirds. Alexi Papas did an interview. Um, and there's like a little short YouTube clip of this that has like 4.5 million views. So, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that this idea has circulated. Um, but that she said that her anecdote was that, you know, she had training that she did, went badly, right? Or at, to any extent, she didn't feel good about. Um, the coach told her that, well, you know, a third of the time you'll feel great. A third of the time you feel average. A third of the time you'll feel bad. And then in the interview, she says, well, and this guy was an Olympian. So, of course, I accepted whatever I said. And now, like, people, like, refer to that. <laughs> this has become, like, this belief that, like, oh, well, that's the distribution of training experiences. Like, you're going to fail a third of the time. Um, a third of the time, you're going to feel neutral. And then one third of the time, you'll feel good. So, basically, to climb the mountain, then, you know, you should really only expect to feel good one third of the time. And I guess to be a great athlete or to improve in athletics or especially if you want to be an elite athlete, I guess you have to be willing to accept the fact that uh, 66% of the time you're not going to feel good and that a third of the time you're actually going to feel really bad, right? And you're only going to, and then the other, rest of the time you'll sort of just be in, the, you'll be in this gray area of maybe you don't hate yourself, but you don't feel good about yourself either. And that one third of the time you'll feel good. And I think what, you know, that's an example of, my interpretation of that is this is a piece of rhetoric by a coach, you know, trying to engage um, with an athlete's sense of, you know, frustration or whatever, right? And I think rather than as the coach say, huh, you know, if we're failing these training sessions, why don't we find training sessions where we can do them successfully all of the time? And this is another, by the way, specific argument against high intensity training, because if you're doing this training paradigm, which supposedly gives more responses, but you know, you're not feeling good or you're going to like fail workouts. I think some people say, oh yeah, well the fact that we're failing, um, you know, a third of the time just shows that we're really taking it to the edge. And I would say the fact that you're failing at all shows that you're past that point. Okay. You're trying to challenge the homeostatic boundary, you know, and if you're experiencing, um, a measurable level of failure, then, you know, you're experiencing trauma because, and I would say that's trauma because if you're failing, and you're not feeling good about yourself, then that's not adversity, okay? Um, that's not working within your 
proficiency capacity or proficiency threshold that is going beyond that point and that's what it feels like it doesn't feel good it's not a space that you seek out it's something that you just keep revolving around and around and around in your head like that's not a space that we want to be in uh that's not good but people use this then now to rationalize their training experience and um i think it a it's incredible to watch how these ideas circulate and develop and I also think, B, it's um, really unfortunate because I think it's pretty unhealthy uh, for people to, you know, look to those kinds of things as a reinforcement or an explainer of what should or should not be going on. What's the alternative to the mountain, right? Because if we want to get out of the cave, right, we need to, like, have something that can help us understand that we're just in the cave in the first place. And this is the ultimate problem or limiter for athletes is if that we don't understand um, that we're in the cave, then we can't conceptualize escape. I think the alternative, and I've talked about this on uh, other episodes in a sort of indirect way, but I want to talk about it more specifically here, is to say um, it's a garden, okay? It's a garden. It's a space. We get to decide what intrapersonal space we want to create, and we have ownership over that, and we should have ownership over that, and the coach is somebody who should be really good at making a garden. And the coach could be somebody who can hear us, hear what we think we might want to create, can help look at that space that we have, can help make suggestions. And then collaboratively, you and a coach or just you and your, you know, friends who are athletes or other athletes, you know, or just you yourself are creating that garden. And that idea of creating an intrapersonal space, I don't mean that in some sort of abstract, you know, mind magic kind of bullshit way. I mean, you know, genuinely, right? That like we're creating an environment for ourselves. The choices we make create the environments that we inhabit. And I think it's easy sometimes to want to look at um, external factors like other situations, other people's behavior, uh, how they act on us. And I don't mean to dismiss that, but I think it sometimes can be really challenging to try to recognize, well, where do we have agency and control? Because I think when we nod, we have agency and control, then we have a responsibility to do things differently. But if we can just point to somebody else or something else, hey, that's awesome. We don't have to worry about this. This isn't our problem. It's not me. It's this other thing. So now I can do nothing. And again, that's idea of, it sort of seems like, um, it's easy for people to find their ways back to these spaces that are traumatic because that's what's familiar, that we tend to go back to what's familiar rather than what's bad. We want to create an environment that stimulates us, that engages us, um, and that uses energy, but we feel more alive and engaged. Like, it needs to be a space where we want to be. That's where we will see growth. Um, and I like the idea of the garden because it's a space where we try to grow things and cultivate things, right? And we try to, and we don't do that by trying to create stress or hardship. We try to do that by, you know, creating the things that um, contribute to the homeostatic environment. We try to enhance that and then elevate that. And over time, we can build that out and expand it. You know, we decide what we let in, we have to decide what we need to keep out, um, but it's constantly changing and developing over time, right? Because our vision, our conceptualization of what that means is something that is evolving and, the, and it gets to evolve. And that's a part of what's cool about being an athlete is you get to do all of these different things. And I think when you're really having the right experience with athletics as an athlete or a coach, um, you're really looking at something that's about creative self-expression. We don't want to fill that space, you know, with things that are going to kill the garden, right? We don't want to overstress 
the plants. We don't want to overwater them, right? We don't want to say, oh, well, plants grow when they get water. In the short term, if we give plants water, they grow faster than the plants that don't have water. Okay, great. You know, let me just get this fire truck in here and, you know, turn on the hose and, you know, drown the whole garden to elicit this stronger response. But that's kind of what people do with, with the mountain climbing thing is they look for this strategy and they say, okay, that's, that's just what I need to do. Um, and there's a clear appeal to imitating others. I would say to a large extent, it's normal and probably somewhat rational to assume that other people who perform well are doing so because they have a process that makes that possible. There's clear limitations to that too, though. Our practice habits need to be dictated by our fitness capacity. Uh, here's a website. A lot of websites now have stuff about lactate threshold. Uh, lactate.com has a little quote in there where they say that, you know, it's easy for, uh, you know, gifted athletes to overtrain lactate threshold because for gifted athletes, they don't really feel the strain of that. Is that really what's going on? Or maybe the gifted athletes have just sort of found themselves naturally to a less intensive version, right? If you were the best athlete on your team, you know, you always looked better, you know, than everybody else when you were working out. It was the people who were struggling, you know, that the coach is going to be focusing on and, you know, pushing harder, you know, but you're that you're that benchmark, right? So you might be a person who kind of through indirect means, you know, arrived at a more effective, more um, equilibrium type experience with this stuff. Um, and but like when we look at the results of other people, false positives are abundant, like weeds in an ill tended garden to the point where a visitor can't tell what was planted and what just grew of its own accord. And it's, of course, quite difficult to differentiate between these things when we're trying to look at what other people are doing and figure out, okay, is there something here that I should be using or taking advantage of? And I think rather than look externally and say, what do studies show? Like, you are your own study. What does your experience show you is working based on the experience that you are having, right? Choice on the part of the athlete is always there. We can choose our environment. Um, that might mean quitting a team, quite frankly, you know, and I think that can be challenging because we perceive that as being socially valuable and necessary. Um, but we perceive that because we are in the cave and we're trying to climb the mountain and, and we are hearing people tell us that you're climbing the mountain. That's so awesome. And we're responsive to that. And so now we're becoming responsive to other things. Um, that have nothing to do with the experience we're having. And the irony of that is you can get to, on a team or get a scholarship or whatever, and that might be the worst thing that could have ever happened to you. And coaches, I think, should recognize that they have an implicit responsibility to communicate their understanding and their justification and evidence for that understanding to the athletes. Um, and it doesn't mean that um, the athletes know more, per se, Right? I think the athletes have a responsibility in turn to educate themselves or become educated in this stuff and, and learn how to think too. Right, Because at that point, there can be the conversation, there can be the collaboration. Uh, the athlete decides what space they want to be in, though. And I think that's significant, not because to say that you know coaches can't you know, try to motivate or engage or encourage or try to, you know, shift the mindset of an athlete. I think if coaches are doing that in the right way, that's really important. But I think sometimes there's this feeling of, you know, this, this thing, this X is the high performance space. I deserve access to that space because that's what allows me to get Y opportunity. But what does that mean? Because I don't agree that we need high performance spaces, these sort of special, you know, institutions that have status um, and that when other people hear we were a part of that, you know, people will sort of ooh and ah and look at us, you know, as a higher form of life. Um, I think those performance spaces are designed around the assumption that we must climb the mountain and that certain people have the means to get us higher up the mountain than others and that to be denied access of, for that performance space um, or for that performance space to be a space that isn't functional for us, um, that that then somehow needs to change to accommodate us. 
it could, right? I mean, that's where in that sense of like, if there's a negotiation, if there's a bargaining process that goes on, that could happen. Um, but it's also possible to look at and say that this is working for other people. It's not working for me. It's not necessarily the responsibility of this thing that is a high performance for others to now totally reinvent itself to be high performance for me, because then you're asking um, maybe for the needs of others to be, you know, sort of like deprioritized. And how do you make that determination of who uh, gets that value of engagement and who doesn't? I think that's an extremely difficult and unresolvable question. So I think the solution must be then to say that, um, you know, I think there are spaces where we see high performance come from but we are misinterpreting what they are based on kind of like the accessories um, that we associate with them because we don't really understand what a high performance space actually is. So we can't look at what's actually going on. Um, and this could be the kinds of like things with money involved, um, money, financial opportunities, brand affiliations, media image, uh, things which in general make people feel important um, but don't none of these things necessarily lead to improvement. And you don't need any of these things to improve. To improve, you need your own garden, right? And that idea of, well, the mountain is so hard, I need this incredible elite team to get me up the mountain, um, versus no. What you need to do is you need to create your garden, right? And maybe some people want to do terrace farming <laughs> in a sense, but like, that's not really where, where we want to be at, I don't think, um, in a broad sense. Um, you, know, you know, these accessorizations that we associate um, with these people who are better or these high performance spaces and these things that there's like these treehouse clubhouses that we want to be a part of, right? Um, you know, we see them 3D printed in a metaphorical sense again and again everywhere. And they're just, you know, printed into average results again and again everywhere. And because those spaces are all the mountain, we create the mountain. We introduce ourselves to the trauma of overextended training by depth of immersion or length of time spent outside the limit of proficiency and tolerance represented by that production possibilities, frontier production possibilities curve. The phrase studies show is based really on the limitations of conceptualization. That is to say um, that we're limited in the studies that we pursue based on we const what we have socially constructed as the things that are worth studying in the first place. And we look to what's hardest for us to do and then assume that our ability to achieve our goal is rooted in a limitation to engage with that hardest thing. And so then we push to that point of trauma again and again, because we think we need by going to that as much as we don't want to be there, we have come to believe that we need to scale that, you know, precipice. Um, and that's the only way to get up there. And that's a kind of target fixation. And we go off course, and then we crash and we wreck ourselves. And we see all of the symptoms of that as a consequence of it. You know, it's, it's a projection of a cultural uh, universal to, you know, look at this incorrectly and to not recognize that the good things happen when we feel good. You know, we can't just remain in Plato's cave if we want to see growth. Uh, here's a quote from a website talking about uh, how we should be training and what lactate threshold supposedly is. Quote, we press on despite the pain, enduring this high-intensity exercise because of the countless benefits. Spring is coming. Maybe this year, plant a garden instead. 
Thanks for listening to today's episode of Black Cat's Run. I hope you found this to be thought-provoking and that there are things in this episode that you can take away and apply to your own training. How we think and how we talk about how we train has a huge impact on the experiences that we have. If you've enjoyed today's episode, you can check us out on Instagram at Black Cat's Run. Send us a message. Let us know what you think about the pod. And we'll catch you next time.